Hello, welcome back to the Untitled SEO Podcast. As you may know if you've listened to us before, we are not just about SEO, but also about sustainability and interesting theory and practice around running an agency. And I have a guest with me today. Uh, Honoured guest, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi there, I'm Pete Martin. I am the founder and I guess team leader at an agency called Always Be Content or Always Be Content. Or is it Always Be Content? I can't never remember. It's one or the other. I've managed to avoid um, asking you that in the future, but I quite like the fact that you, you opened with that because I, I, I like it both ways. Always be content because in SEO, the answer always be content, although um, you wouldn't write it now. <laughs> but also always be content, also very good. So you've also mentioned something else in your introduction there that I'd like to unpack a little. You didn't call yourself the CEO or the managing director. You called yourself a team leader. Why, why is that? Yeah, that's that's quite, I mean, it's intentional. I think it's become quite natural to us to talk like that. Um, I mean, I've been in the agency business quite a long time. And um, I suppose when we started Always Be Content, the idea was to have a very flat structure. Um, and that's sort of reflected in some of the language we use inside the business. Um, and it's reflected in the way we organize ourselves. So it's, we've, we, we don't really have that hierarch- hierarchical thing. Um, you know, where it sort of makes everything sluggish and um, more formal than it has to be. Um, so that's probably ref- just reflected in some of the terminology we use. Um, I mean, I don't want, want to sound like one of these old war horses. Um, when, we, when we started Always Be Content, um, we'd come out of the sort of agency PLC environment um, where nobody's really happy. Um, so that's sort of the, the joke was sort of in the name of the in the name of the business. Um, the plan was on the one hand to do content marketing because everything's content these days, and um, but also to be to find a happier way to do business and um, a more fulfilling way to run your career, and and that's reflected in the the way the business is structured and the way we're structured is reflected in the terminology we use, and that's probably why I why I said that. Okay, so let's go back to the start and, and see if we can kind of pick into how you arrived at, at the decision to start start your agency in this way. So you started your career in the early 80s, is that right? Um, <laughs> yes, I did. Yes, I did. Yeah, I was, I was, I've been in the business so long, I was struggling to remember, remember which decade it was in. Yeah, but um, I suppose my tr- career truly t- took off when, um, you know, I'd, wor- I'd worked as a, I started as a copywriter. Um, and you know, spelling and grammar, and I'd, I'd left university with a degree in a, a master's in you know English language and literature, the most useless degree on the face oh. of the planet. You know, <laughs> sounds, sounds like I, it'd be good for copywriting, right? You'd think so, but I knew I knew a lot about James Joyce and the Jacobeans and nothing about the real world. You know, so it, it, it sort of worth starting starting worth starting working the agency came as a bit of a shock. It was a bit of a shock to me, and um, so that, so that's, that I got that's where I started and. Um, but we we started our own agency in in the early nineties, um, an agency called Smarts, and it's still going strong. We we we, well, we we grew that to to a point where we sold it to a PLC, and um, that P, the PLC still owns that business. It's got six branches across the UK, and uh, I stuck with the PLC for another sixteen years. Uh, worked in the UK, uh, was was the executive creative director of the New York agency for a while. And then you know, came back to the UK, and you know, this is this isn't really to speak ill of any individual because pe- you know people were doing their bit, what they thought was best for the business and best for themselves. But you know, when when times when times were good, they they, they just they, they sucked the money out, and when times were hard, they threw the talent out. And it got to the point where I was thinking, this is just no way to run a, a sustainable business, you know, to, where you can sort of, people can have confidence, not just in the sustainability of the business, but in the sustainability of their careers and um, how, how to bring sort of some stability and growth in, into it. And so that that sort of finally got to me. And probably the, this is going to, this is sort of a, a bit of a diversion, a sort of personal thing. I, I, I came to the point in 2016 where my dad passed away and um it wasn't it wasn't exactly unexpected because he was he was in his 90s but um it did it did sort of make me reevaluate my life and my priorities and what i thought was important and that was probably a, a catalyst for thinking you know I've, I've actually just had enough of this you know um this is just not the way i th- want to do things and I, th- I think i should be putting my energies into 
run into doing something different and doing it in a, in a different way. And that's where the idea for Always Be Content came from. We just thought, well, let's let's try and do something different and start start again, um, which we did with, with moderate success so far, it has to be said. So you mentioned the we there, um, and I, I know that's not the royal we. You're not just talking about yourself. Uh, how, did you, <laughs> how, how did you gather people around you who, who felt the same way? Well, some some of the some of the people who coalesced um, around that idea came from the other agency. Um, you know, fortunately, one my wife was one of them, so it's, it, they, they found it quite hard to argue that my wife would want to leave the business at the same time as I did. Um, but another pe- another another handful of people also just had had enough um, and subject to contractual obligations. Um, they all left, and then we we, we grouped together um, six months later and started the business. Um, you know, and that's just how 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 the cookie crumbled. So I'm I'm really interested in in that gap of time between making the decision and actually starting the agency. I mean, I I know that there'll be people who are younger than either of us listening to this who want to start an agency, and there's a sort of a mystical period of well, how did people get from nothing, just a blank sheet of paper? To running an agency that reflects the values they wish it to. I mean, did, did you spend a lot of time planning, or do you just say, right, on the first of September the agency will start, and you sit there <laughs> drinking coffee? And, and I know that's probably not what happened, but I, I thought I'd find another extreme. <laughs> yeah, um, it's. I mean, I've, I've started two agencies. Um, poss- if you if you count a relaunch of of, of a in fact, if you count a, a, a relaunch of two PLC agents, I've done it four times, um, and and it's on the one hand, it's easier than you think. Um, you know, the, the the journey of a thousand miles begins with but a single step, said the the ancient Chinese sage Lao Tzu, and um, and that's what you do. You just think, well, I'm just going to start, and I'm just going to do it. Um, so it, that that in itself has some sort of the power of some life changing magic, um, but. Prior to doing that, you have to do a little bit of due diligence. You have to sort of be realistic about you know what your what your what your likely revenues might be, um, what your what your likely costs might be. You know how you're going to in inverted commas duck and dive for the first period until you get yourself set up. You know what are, you know you you will need some you will need a little bit of money to tide you over and a little bit of money for some equipment and so on. I mean, it's a lot easier to start an agency these days. When I when I first started, um, you know, agencies were the principals and all of their clients' dealings, so you had to have some financial solidity. Um, you know, when agencies went bust back in the day, it was because their clients failed, and you were you were on the hook for what they owed. Um, so you know that was that was so it was a lot harder. You needed media accreditation and stuff, so it was a lot harder to start an agency back in the day. Um, but these days, you know, you you need. You need good. You need some. You need a good idea of what you're what you're planning to do. What's a bit different, and it really helps to have a network, you know, of people and contacts that that might potentially give you business. Nothing in this world is guaranteed, um, but you know, you need a bit of a you need a bit of a proposition and and a bit of a a bit of daring do to go out and try and sell it and convert. You know, I think I think you're touching on the point about network, and I the listeners can't tell how old I am, but I am. A- I'm not not as young as some, but not as old as others. And if, if people in, say, the early 20s or even contemporaries who want to start an agency or start freelancing ask, what's the first step? I always say, speak to people. Hmm. If you don't speak to people, then nothing is going to happen. You can call that networking and you can go to formal networking events. But ultimately, it's just about finding your crowd and finding, finding people who are, don't find you wholly objectionable. And uh, you know, might want to tolerate kind of spending some more time with you. Um, so you, you talk, also mentioned there about having having a proposition. So perhaps a unique selling point, or or a theme, or yeah. I mean, it's, it's interesting. I've, I've got, I'm good friends with a with a with a guy who spent a lot of years as an as a consultant who advises clients on which agencies to to select um and this is assuming you know that somebody's going to start an agency that isn't just you know that isn't just a freelance business you know it's a it's an agency with a bit of scale and a bit of a bit of um a bit of oomph behind it and he and he always says that the thing the thing that you have to go to a client with first and foremost is recent relevant experience you know have you you know have you done something that's a bit like what the client might want to do you might have a different take on it a different spin on it but you're going to have to persuade somebody that you have the 
the the talent and the experience and the track record to you know take their money and do something useful with it. So it's quite I think so it's quite it's quite difficult to say you know I've got a degree in basket weaving and I'd like uh, you know and and by the way you know Cadbury's I'd like your advertising account you know I think that's that's quite a stretch. Um, so I think if you if you've got if you've if you could if you've got some reasonable experience I mean before I started an agency I'd, I'd had eight. I'd had eight years as a copywriter, you know, um, and senior creative, and had worked on, you know, TSB and other sort of national accounts for for four or five years. So I'd had, I'd got quite a lot of, um, quite a lot of experience behind me. Even even though I think we were relatively young, and you know, every, everybody thinks this in a, a different decade. You know, it's ten years from now. I think I was relatively young and naive now. <laughs> but, but I think you know, looking back, you know, we were thirty. We were thirty when we started the, our first agency. Um, and what we lacked, what we lacked in um, in sort of uh, solidity, um, we we made up for with pres- pres- with presumption, you know. <laughs> so yeah. so it was, uh, you know, we, we we filled in the gap with bravura, and um, and that went that went all right because we we learned pretty fast as we went along. So I'm just making a note of that. What you lacked in ability, you made up with presumption. I like that. That's a I don't know where that quote might pop up in my life, but I think it's a good one. Um, well, I think it speaks of, of enthusiasm. One of the things, uh, one of the things I like about people who are relatively new to freelancing or relatively new agencies is that that enthusiasm, the kind of the the the, the real burning desire to make it. There's no comfort zones. You, you you've got to do it because if you don't do it, nothing's going to happen. So that that's why I, why I like that quote. So yeah. I mean. To kind of tie this to SEO, it's a challenge in SEO to say we've done this before in this market because it's unethical to work in to have two clients in one market. Right. But the way we relate it is to say yes, this is a similar framework or a similar challenge that we we've, we've met before, and this is how we how we made progress with it. Um, speaking of the word ethic, there the the uh, the structure of your agency. Um, I read read a news article which. Um, from the Scotsman from a few years ago, to be fair, and it talked about how your how always be content was a holocratic organisation. Mm. Mm. That's a, that's a, <laughs> that is that's a good question. Um, it's it's inter- I mean, if if you're interested in in or you know in organisational theory, which um, if you've ever worked in larger organisations, you you end up having to be interested in because you think how in the hell. Are things happening here, and why isn't why don't things work better than than they currently do? Um, there, there are sort of you know when when I, when I was getting frustrated within the within the sort of PLC environment, um, you you end up in a in thinking like this 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 be the way this is organised can't be right, um, and 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 it isn't you know because if you if you I got I got interested in organisational theory and if there's a there's a great book. Called, um, oh, I think it's called Revolution Organization, um, by Frederick Lulac, and he, he talks about the history of organization, of, of history of organizations, and he's, he's color coded them. The first one is the sort of red organization. That's a sort of, um, if you went back to the, the sort of brutality of, you know, um, the Middle Ages of, of people just fighting out and you know, you know, you know stabbing each, literally stabbing each other on the battlefield and killing each other. Um, so it was a very dangerous thing to be a king. So th- those organisations are very like the mafia. You know, they, they they rule by fear and power, and they they tend to leave very little um, of value in their wake. He said, but as time went on, people realised that that's not partic- that sort of constant instability isn't isn't particularly good. So you end up with with a with a sort of a what you would call like an orange type um, organization, so like the Catholic Church or the Army, that's that's designed for stability. You know, that's, these these don't change; they're very rule governed. Um, they they and they're very stable, but they don't progress, um, and they get themselves into all kinds of bother in the background, um, because they're not meritocratic. So so they tend to they tend towards corruption. And um, so then you come up towards the Industrial Revolution, and you, then you, you need you need a meritocratic organization. Um, and that's that's a lot. That's still a lot better. And then you come up towards the sixties, you get these sort of green organisations where, well, it can't just be meritocracy. The, the the business has to contribute some something positive to society. And then you get the sort of where we are now, where it's actually, it's not just about making a profit. Um, that tends to have bad consequences in the in the short term. 
um, and the long term. So you need what you call a teal organisation, which is more focused on your environment and social and governance obligations. And that those and those te- and each one of those types of organisations tend tend to be more productive and more effective than the previous forms of them, and and tend to do better. And so that that's the sort of background to it. Um, and those last type of organisations are also called holocratic organisations. Really. Um, I can't remember the guy who cha- who, who started Holacracy, but it's, it's a defined system with its own vocabulary, um, and it's trademarked, and you can you can be, you can get you can you can operate your business through their platform called Glassfrog. So it's 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 and it's got its own it's got its own vernacular, um, which is possibly where some of the terminology we use comes from. But it's actually very simple. It's just a very flat, organised way of organize, of organising your business around core principles. T- as opposed to having the sort of pyramidic shape that you would have in a classical um, hierarchical business, it's organised into, into flat circles, uh, and each circle has its own level of expertise. All of the things that are subjectively assumed within a within a business, you know, what you think this is what somebody's going to do, this is what the roles and responsibilities are. They're not spelled out, and those are all made clear in holacracy. You know, you actually spell out what somebody's domains are, what the limits of their authority are, and the general principle is that everybody's allowed to do. Um, what they want um, within their level of domain with the proviso that they speak to the people who might be impacted by their decisions. Um, wow. and, and that is an amazing break on on what people might do. Um, and it, it leads to better, faster decision making because you think, well, I can, I'm going to, I think I should do this thing, but I'm going to have to ask, I'm going to have to talk to the people who might be impacted by this. Because in another organization, the answer is what usually happens, I'm not going to do anything until somebody above me tells me to do it. It's, it's a fascinating thing. I, I've never worked in a, an agency other than well, my one, which is there's, there's three of us and all the freelancers. Uh, but I have got people I work with regularly who have worked in agencies and they tend to either appreciate the, the traditional hierarchy or absolutely abhor it. I, I run another podcast um, called, <laughs> it's called SEO or Die and we call it the punk rock side of, of SEO because it's looking at challenging the preconceptions about the way we make money and how we operate and the ethics of being somebody who helps businesses grow and, and and trying to work with people who, who echo the values that we have. But the person I run it with, yeah, he'd say he's he's from an agency and his attitude is very much work with a really big agency if you want some of your budget to be spent on a five star meal they take you out for. Which <laughs> I've never worked in an agency and I'm, I'm paraphrasing I think I am paraphrasing. I think that is exactly <laughs> what he said. But but the the, the kind of the, the style of organization that, that always be content is it seems to be, I don't know if railing against it is too aggressive a way of describing it, but it, it doesn't seem to fit that at all. It seems to be more like a, we've got a bunch of friends who run a housing co-op here in Ipswich, so mm-hmm. a load of people bought a, a very run down two or three houses in a row, and everyone who lives there makes a contribution to repairing the house, essentially. And it's it's uh, non-autonomous or autonomous, I forget which way around it is, but you know there is no boss, It's every, all the decisions get made by a committee. And some people move in and it drives them mad and they move out. Some people move in and absolutely love it and they've been there for years and years. Do you, do you it's very difficult for you to say for your own organisation, but can you see how somebody might come from one type of an agency to um, a slightly newer Yes. Model of agency and just go no, I, I don't like this. Yeah, I mean one of one of one of the challenges we found in the early days. I mean, we've been going for six years now. Was that some people who came from from a different style of agent? I mean, and I mean some of them, not everybody, um, struggled to take us at our word. You know, um, you know, you are empowered to do the right thing. You know, as long as you tell other people what your intentions are. You know, I, I intend to do X. Um, and they just didn't believe it, um, so and still tried to behave as if they were, as if they were working in you know. So that sort of learned helplessness, um, as if they're working in a traditional organisation, and that's that's quite irrit- that's quite irritating for, you know, for the style of organisation we where we are where you know, it's like well, you're you have the you have the talent and the training and the the capability and uh, the and you've been told what direction we're heading in. 
you've got the you've got the ability to make your own decisions, and you keep on asking me to make the decision for you. That's that, that is quite irritating. But some some people struggle to believe to believe you really. Um, and and in and in truth, um, it, it, I mean, the, there's a there's a difference between what I would call, you know. I've worked in agencies where it is disorganized, you know, um, even there's a hierarchy, but it is disorganized. I, w- I won't tell you which agency it was, but I, I, I was sent by the PLC to look after their worst performing agency um, and to turn it round. And it was, it was dysfunctional on the, only on the basis that it was very hierarchical, but it had a really erratic leader. Um, sorry, I, I, I'm using the leader. In the, there was a guy who lived, who, who sat in the corner office who was really dysfunctional. <laughs> and, and 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 that, that really puts it in perspective. Just just changing that description, doesn't it? Because I yeah. don't understand the corner. Yeah, and he, he and yeah, this is probably all libelous if 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 it was to name him, but you know, he came in late, he left early, he spent a lot of money on expenses, he chased the women, he did, you know, all of all of you could probably li- list all of the traits that went with that went with that went that went with um poor went with poor management and fiscal irresponsibility um and that agency was losing you know a fortune on a on a on a daily basis and um so on, a, on an annual basis um and i've quite forgotten where this where this was going but you know i think there's a there's a there's a difference between being disorganized and being self-organized and that's what we're asking people to do you know to take responsibility this is this is your domain these are the things you would have been asked to do um you're responsible for them. You're accountable for them, um, but you're but you're but you're running yourself, and instead of waiting for me to t- for waiting for me to tell you what to do, and it, but you know, ultimately, there is there is there is it. There are you know if if somebody comes to me and says I intend to do this, and I think whoa 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 don't do that, you know there is still a there is there are still checks and balances, um, and there are still more there are still more senior and less senior people but it just means that their 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 ability to their domains are more restricted you know um and domains domains is one of those is one of those holacracy words that means you know this is the area in which you have in which you have self control you know i yeah it, it it sounds a lot less stressful in in a lot of ways because uh, i can imagine working in a, in a, a far more traditional top down thing you worried about what the boss might say and I agree. It's kind of frustrating, possibly a bit sad that some people might think that that was that having the sort of anarcho, and I mean that in a positive way, you know, the positive use of the word an anarchist, having the anarchist freedom might be a trap to undo them in some way. <laughs> like that, that's wild. It, it might just be that you know, a hundred years time, if all businesses are run in a similar way, there might be history books talking about the fact that in the early days, adoption was challenging, and, and yeah. uh, you know. It, when when, uh, when you're several hundred years old or whatever, kind of looking back and go, I remember that. That seems like a very different world, kind of, kind of back then. Um, so I, I can I'm, I can certainly see how running an agency along slightly more narco or kind of balanced lines like this is is a good thing internally. One of the reasons I want to speak to you on this podcast um, in the first place is because you're one of the first agencies I've met who are B Corp set. Mm-hmm. And um, B Corp has its has its controversies, as does anything else. But I'm just interested to know how how you you came to the decision to pursue B Corp, and and also to talk a little bit about ESG, if that's okay. Yeah, um, I mean it was quite it was quite interesting because we we tender for a lot of business, um, and we have in the past, and there's almost always some question around you know, environmental certification. Um, and which, you know, which is fine if you're, you know, a massive conglomerate of some kind that is, you know, if you're, if you're a massive contractor that's, that's tendering to build a, you know, a power plant or something, all of those questions become, all the sort of ISO questions become relevant to you. Um, but we're a, we're a sort of human driven, small, small to medium sized business. Um, and it just you know the, the whole sort of paper based frameworks don't make don't really make any sense for us. So we were we were always looking for a simple answer to that question, other other than the sort of hand crank hand cranking an answer every time we we filled in a form. And um, 
we we sort of built up a level of expertise in environmental and you know sustainability and to some extent governance question sort of by default i mean our our biggest customer um when we first started up was british gas um and you know all of the energy companies are interested in are interested in environmental uh, you know environmental impacts and advising their customers on how to reduce carbon and all the rest of it so that was so that, so that was sort of one element of it um sse were another one of our clients they're sort of big one of the sort of biggest um renewable producer in the uk so that was another sort of string turbo so we, we, we ended up knowing a lot about environmental um standards and and credentials um and then equally, we worked with the Scottish government in, in places like Liverpool and the NHS, where there's a lot of social marketing involved. So we'd, we'd got sort of got an, an angle on on the um, on the sort of the social aspect of, and then governance. You know, we've already talked about the, the sort of the the uh, and having an interest in you know what what formal structures and the impact that those structures have. So we, we had a bit of an interest in ESG, and um, you know, when I was in New York, we worked a lot on. Um, on Wall Street and you know ESG investing is a very big thing, so we we sort of had that angle in it as well. So almost by happenstance, um, we we sort of came across B Corp and we thought, oh, this looks very straightforward. Let's let's you know they've got the sort of self quiz thing. Let's fill that in. And the the trick that you 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 take the sort of self test, and the trick is to get to eighty points. And if you get to eighty points, you're probably in 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 scope for your know, Beast Corp certification. Um, and what we found was that the first sixty five were dead easy. Um, <laughs> the next five were pretty hard, and the ten after that were were hellish. And um, so it sort of it sort of it was sort of a reality check on what on, on what we thought of, of of our own accomplishments really and what we were doing. Um, so it forced us to consider. You know, having just gone through the, the relatively simple opening process, it sort of forced us to take a solid look at, at, at you know what we were doing. And then the other part of it that came as a bit of a shock to the system when it actually came to certification is you know filling in the 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 self certif the self the self completion part of it was you know it was tough to get to the last to get to the last few marks and all the rest of it. But when it came to the certification certification part, they started to ask you really hard questions and for documentary evidence, and that that came as a shock to the system. And um, partly, partly because of my own behavioural style, I guess, where you know, I sort of like, hey, who needs paperwork? You know, all <laughs> that stuff. So, so um, we had to really dig. We had to really dig for the evidence um, and start and put in place processes that where we collected the evidence that, that, that you know not only that we did the things that we said we did, um, but that we actually then tracked what the what the impacts of those are and what and that was the hard bit. It took us ages um, and a lot of toing and froing with them. It, probably the best part of two years um, to get from you know hey sixty five we're nearly there to oh my god oh my god <laughs> you know. Yeah, there's things that I've looked at. Um, I'm, I'm the, the first step, I think you'd call it. And there are things that I have never considered in yeah. 23 years of running a business. I, I have these things have just not been in my brain by by my foolish thinking. I originally looked at it thinking, well, I don't have a car. Uh, you know, I was thinking very much in terms of, of carbon and in terms of, of environmental sustainability, but. There is a lot about it, which is about people, as I understand it. And I, I, I found that process really interesting and really useful to go, actually, I haven't actually thought about what I would do in this circumstance. So I, I found I found it good, but I, I don't know if I'm going to get all the way through it, if I'm honest. I'm kind of, now I've seen sort of behind the curtain, as it were. Yeah. And I'm, quite in, I'm quite impressed if I meet someone who has managed to get out the other side of it, which is the point. It's not an easy thing. It's not. It's not a, a way of greenwashing and, and paying some money so you can get a logo. Or no, like I that. think I think it's I think it's genuinely difficult, and they've you know they, they've certainly put in a, put in enough checks and barriers to to make it genuinely difficult for you to 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 achieve the certification. I think in some ways the the process is easier if you are they, they might deny this, but I think the process is easier if you're a small. Um, 
social or social business. You know, uh, you know, you, I'm, I hesitate to say not a real company, but you know what I mean. If, if you're, if you're, if you're, if your fundamental setup is to serve a, a community of some kind, um, and it's slightly not for profit, I think that makes your your task a lot easier. Um, it's possibly easier as well if you're very large and have got the capacity and people and you know and the 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 paperwork and all the rest of it to to track it but being being a medium sized business um we we found that difficult one one just the i mean as you say some of the things that sort of came out of the woodwork were things that we hadn't really considered you know we we had all of the sort of carbon stuff the you know um, we'd, we'd covered off all of the sort of external, quite easy stuff to do, but the, you know, well, what is your local impact? Do you, and we had to go, well, what do we, what do we do? And we're like, mm-hmm. yeah, we take in, we, and this is, this is true. We, 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 you know, we take in students on a paid internship and we do, you know, and we make sure that they come from certain backgrounds and all the rest of it. Did, but we, we do it. Have we codified it? No, we hadn't. Did we have a policy mm-hmm. on it? Not really. It was done on, it was done in the back of a fag packet. And then yeah. had we tracked any of it? No, we hadn't. And, and the same, the same with some of the stuff they asked about. You know, the work, our work in underserved communities. Did we do it? Yes, we did. Did we track it? Yeah, but it was in a document. You know, f- that was a client document, and it, it was you know that was done for presentation purposes, and and it, so we had to go and really rake for the rake for the evidence down in in, in amongst our own in amongst our own systems. You know, yeah, I'm in a similar situation. I do um, I'm part of the pro bono network here in Suffolk in England, and those those kind of questions even at my early stage it was saying you know, do, do you what do you, you know, how do you uh, help community resilience and things like mm-hmm. that and i was like well someone from the pro bono network says well this organization organization needs some support do you want to do it and i go hey that would be cool yeah and then we talk and then we do stuff and we both go that was smart and then that's it <laughs> like the <laughs> idea the idea of actually like Doing paperwork for it, it is. I was like, I have never even considered that. Yeah, we, we yeah. treat them as we would any of our clients. But then a lot of client work, you don't document every step of every way because well, most our clients would rather be getting on with the work and absolutely, and, and that's it. So that, that that's one thing. And you, you mentioned when you and I have had conversations before about about kind of ES, ESG and. In an email you sent me just before this recording, you you mentioned ESG being and sustainability being essential to long term profitability. And we've touched on that with some of the things that we've talked about already. But that specific phrase about ESG being essential to long term profitability, yeah. Um, I should ask, can you remember writing that? And are you okay to kind of unpack it? A bit? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, one of one of the one of the questions. I mean, th- there is there's a load of evidence that, um, and this this comes from the sort of financial markets that companies with strong ESG credentials, you know, a portfolio of of, of funds of companies that are made of, that are, that have strong ESG credentials, outperforms the index by you know six seven percent a year, and that's. That's an astonishing number, really, in financial markets because at seven percent a year compound, you'll you'll double your you'll double your money in ten years. So it it, it makes an aston- it makes an astonishing imp- it makes an astonishing impact. And sort of one of the background questions is you you go, how does that happen? Why would a company that is interested in its environmental credentials, its social obligations, and the governance structure of the business, how would that deliver six seven percent more? return than your average business that, that isn't interested in those things. Because classically, if you went back to the sort of 60s, the, the, the godfather of monetarism, you know, uh, Friedman, the, the economist said, you know, the pursuit of business, the pursuit of profit is the only business of business. You know, it's about, it's about nothing else, your know, return to the shareholder. And even if you talk to, you know, some business people these days they will well environmentalism is a cost isn't it it's, you know it adds money you know what you use could lead you to a greenium and people don't like paying extra for you know green products cost extra and why is that um but the, the evidence from the financial markets is that is that companies with esg focus do better and you know how does that work and i've sort of rationalized it to myself in 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 this way in that 
a company that's taken care of its environmental and social and governance obligations is just better managed. Um, you know, I, I jokingly referred to the bloke in the corner office with a load of bad traits, um, which had loads of ba- bad business outcomes. And if you magnify that up um, into a large business, you can sort of see how one the lack of governance sort of sort of breeds sort of breeds bad practice and financial irregularity on a, on a large scale. And those, you know, you only have to think about Enron and all the rest. And, and those catch up with people eventually. Um, uh, when I w- was in New York, I had the uh, the great misfortune to work with uh, Lehman Brothers at one point, and they were the rudest, um, most unpleasant client I've ever worked with. And that sort of, um, if, you'd, if you'd asked me, rationally at the time in the early 2000s did i think they were good bust i'm like no these guys think they're the kings of the universe and they're making a fortune but if i thought if you'd if we'd if i'd thought about it with what i know now i thought like, actually this probably stinks these guys are let's use a phrase scottish phrase bam pots there's pr- <laughs> bam it's, it's their bam pots it's, <laughs> it's, it, there's, it's probably rotten at the core and it's probably rotten at the core in some way um so by in contrast, businesses that take care of their environmental obligations, their social obligations, and their governance have covered off their future risks much more clearly, um, and are much and and what what they're doing is much more less likely to come back around and bite you um, and society in 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 the ass. Um, and and in some and in some ways, you know, I think the the sort of governance aspect. I mean, there was a famous um, example with one of the car manufacturers who in the Super Bowl a few years ago, where they put out a, an ad talking about, um, you know, how it's important that you know females should be empowered, and it was a, a little girl go karting with her dad or something, and and it was a it was a beautifully expensively made ad about the importance of you know empowering women, and then they released a photograph of their their board of directors, which was like thirteen middle aged white men. Um, and it, and everybody's like, it, it, just, it just sort of cut the whole thing off at the knees. And that that company was part of the group that w- that was also that was also part of the um, the sc- the scandal around emissions, um, misrecorded emissions. So you know these things these things are not disconnected because they've just not thought them through properly. There's a brilliant phrase I learned just a few days ago from a PR agent I work with um, with a charity that I uh, do pro bono work actually for and. She used the phrase "pale, stale, and male." Yeah, pale, I stale, and male. Yeah. I suddenly thought, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I can see, I can see that 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 does summarise quite quite a lot of things. So, um, I just wanted to ask a slightly awkward question, I guess, because I can see that that the sort of your your mission towards sustainability and ESG and the B Corp things are well aligned with you. I think it, it very much you were that way already and developing the, your ESG policy and the B Corp thing sort of helped you flesh it out a bit more, but it, it was something that, that was already in evidence. Um, how, how far do you think it's fair to go to make these things really clear to people? Because I'm thinking in terms of, it's becoming increasingly apparent that millennials, just a pigeonhole the whole generation, are, are now looking for an ESG link in the footer of a website. and what what dangers do you think there are? Do you, do you have you got any examples? Uh, and please don't mention the company names of um, ESG policies you've seen on websites. You thought they didn't really yeah, must be real. Yeah, I mean, there's there there. I mean the the biggest examples are are the are the are in the fossil fuel industry. Really, everybody knows that. Um, the class, the, 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 I mean, the classic, the classic example. I mean, it's it's not dissimilar to the previous example. And I, I won't, I won't name the the oil company that did it, but they put they put a tweet saying, you know, what are you going to do for climate change? And everyone like, what do you mean? What the hell are you going to do? Do you mean I'll <laughs> stop using you for stuff? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so I mean, it's there's a there's a load there's a load of it. There's a, there's a load of it around, and the. The the cha- the, cha- the challenge is is I mean it's interesting because you you th- this you know every, everybody understands that um you know they they want to do their own bit and um you know save energy at home and recycle and all the other things that are part of, part of being a, de- a decent citizen um, but there's a limit to there's a limit to what the individual can do and when the financial system and the the way the 
the, the I mean, it's, it's it's not really a secret that the, the, the fossil fuel companies are making money hand over fist right now. You know, largely, you know, profiteering off the back of a of a of a war, um, um, which I think is um, you know it's it's pretty much disgraceful. I think you know that they've been allowed that they've been allowed to do so. Um, I think all, all of all of that you you can see how the you know if if as an investor you're saying well. There's a lot of money to be made in there, so the the whole the whole the whole sort of intermingling of the of the financial and the the sort of the the I suppose the wider governance of society, you know, the how we how we tax how we tax and add and levy people who are who are making who are making exorbitant um, sums off the back of of public suffering, you know, um, I think that's there's something to be said about that. You know, and and they're all interconnected. You know, what? How does your? How does our, our pension funds, our banks, our investment companies, the fossil fuel companies themselves? How how is all of that tied together to incentivize the investors to support it? You know, I think all of that is is needs to be unpicked um, and and looked at. And and so some of it comes back to. I mean, I'll, I'll give you a very straightforward. I'll give you a very straightforward example and why why I think. It is systemic. It's it's completely systemic, and it really is a question of governance um, in the widest sense of the word. If you if you went back a few years, um, the now the now infamous Quasi Quarteng was business secretary, and he was responsible for shutting. Um, or let me let me rephrase this. Um, he refused to help fund um, Britain's biggest gas storage um, facility, um, so it got closed. Um, it was owned, but it was owned by Centrica, but it needed upgraded, and he refused to help fund it, so it got closed. Um, fast, fast forward a few a few years, and um, you know, as part of as part of the glide path to um, to the to renewables, um, gas was cheap. You know, gas was about was about two p a, a kilowatt, and people well, you know, if we, we'll use cheap gas, and that will fill in the gap in between. You know, being able to build enough uh, renewable electricity, we'll have to electrify the country at some point to, to get rid of the emissions. But in the meantime, cheap gas will fill in the gap, and that that will be fine. Um, but you can see exactly what the problem with that is going to be, because suddenly, you know, we've got a war in Ukraine. A whole, you know, the wholesale price of, of gas goes through the roof. It's now something like twenty five. I'm going to say it's twenty. I'm getting this wrong, but it's probably now twenty five p a kilowatt um, for electricity. So the whole th- and and so the and the lack of the sudden lack of storage meant that the UK's whole um, energy security was compromised. So that the, the complete lack of foresight from sort of systemic government forward thinking to properly funding renewable energy, properly funding and, and structuring renewable energy investment um, to try and it's it's just completely mistaken. You know, I don't know if any of that made any sense to you, but oh, it does. You you you've tied you tied it together in a way that. That, that makes a lot of sense it's not about what you're doing right this second it's, it's it comes down to good good business management again you can't cut your nose off despite your face yeah totally. it, it, it may be that you can't make the the i'm just chucking stuff out there now but it might be that you can't make massive changes right now but you can make decisions now that will lead to you and your organization having the flexibility to make larger changes in the future and it's always difficult to talk in definites because all businesses are so different. But I think that's why seeing more and more people with good ESG policies is kind of helping everyone move that way. So purely my my own um, you know, my own experience of it is that the more other people's policies I read, the more ideas I get for my own business. Basically, it's it's making it a common conversation that. That doesn't sound out of place. It's part of the natural flow of. <laughs> Can you hear my you. sneezing? <laughs> Brilliant. Less um, less less pepper on your dinner, I think. <laughs> um, th- this has been an absolutely fascinating um, conversation, Pete. I really appreciate it. Um, I've noticed that we we've gone on a little bit longer than than I'm, I intended to, but I, I don't want to slam the door when when things are so interesting. But we're going to have to wrap out now. Is there is there any sort of sign off you'd like to give any sort of final statement or 
you can sneeze. I mean, it appears to be the, the dumb that thing. Seems to be, it seems to be the dumb thing. I am allergic to cats, so you're fortunate that we do have a cat in this house. So um, this is my wife's plan to kill me early, I think. But um, she's a... She's a, but yeah, no, um, that was great, Andrew. I really enjoyed that. Um, I don't know if I made was completely coherent at any point. So if you've got, if you, if you, if you want me to clarify any point, anybody who's listening, you'll just reach out to me on LinkedIn. And um, I do enjoy a good debate. Um, I think the, I think the other, the other thing I've been saying to people, um, and this, this, this goes for for younger people as well as older, as well as older punters like ourselves or like me, um, is you know they they often say you know you know, keep your opinions to yourself in business. You know, your, your boss might disagree with you. The company might disagree with it. But I think, you know, um, F it, you know. Um, the time has come where people need to say what they think. And, you know, you there'll be, there's no shortage of, of people with regressive ideas willing to stick their head above the parapet and say horrible things. Um, it's time for all men of good conscience and girls of good conscience to, to say what they think and um, put their mouth where their heart is. I think that that's a wonderful way to, to end things. So I'm going to say goodbye, Pete. Would you like to say goodbye? Goodbye, everybody. Peace out, y'all.